Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Parker. I am Ken Galbraith's biographer, and I teach here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. This evening marks the conclusion of two days of a conference in honor of John Kenneth Galbraith, but not a conference that looked back at Ken's life, but that looked through Ken's life forward to the future of liberalism and the future of America and the world. The conversations have been rich. They have covered a wide range of topics as befits Ken Galbraith, not just economics, but foreign policy, domestic politics, domestic policy, military affairs. And we've been blessed with a great list of uh, speakers and participants uh, with us these last two days. This evening, we're going to watch a remarkable uh, documentary made by the Canadian Broadcast Corporation in the very last years of Ken's life. These are the last major television interviews that Professor Galbraith gave. This will be the American premiere of that Canadian uh, broadcast film, an award-winning film from Canada. And afterward, I'm going to invite onto the stage uh, Jamie and Peter Galbraith, along with Alan Brinkley, E.J. Dion, and Samantha Power, all of them friends of Professor Galbraith, to discuss his life and his legacy. Let me, before we begin, however, draw attention to Catherine Galbraith, Professor Galbraith's widow, who is with us here tonight. who in the course of my biography I discovered more than perhaps anyone else made Ken Galbraith possible. He's of a generation of men who, as Kitty Galbraith once told me, never changed a diaper in his life. <laughs> and her gift was to assure the growth of a wonderful family and leave him free to write 48 books that sold more than seven and a half million copies and in an extraordinary number of ways influence not only this university, but the nation and the world. So with that, can we roll the film? And after it is over, we will begin our discussion. Thank you. The morning that Catherine Galbraith and I were leaving for New York and on to India, uh, I had breakfast with JFK, as we called him, and uh, the New York Times was on the table. And uh, on the front page was a column on the new ambassador to India. And Kennedy fingered the column and said, how would you like that? And I replied, I liked it all right. I thought it was pretty good but I don't see why they had to call me arrogant. And Kennedy said, I don't see why not, everybody else does. I'm not full of optimism now. The uh, economy is certainly not in good shape. And there's, of course, Iraq. So that I would like to do this comment in a glow of optimism, but uh, that would be deeply fraudulent. I should really like to describe myself as a pragmatist. It seems to me that when there's something needs to be done by the, by the state, it should be done by the state. Something is being successfully done, by private enterprise, certainly one shouldn't change them. The important thing is not to have your intelligence subordinated to some ideological pattern, which in many cases does not fit. Conventional wisdom. John Kenneth Galbraith coined that phrase, then proceeded to rip it apart. Just because there is a prevailing attitude doesn't mean it's right. He's 95 now, looking back at an accomplished career as a writer, professor, politician, and perhaps the best-known economist in the English language. Most importantly, though, Galbraith has considered himself an abiding liberal for his entire life. In the American sense, 
His liberalism has withstood the late 20th century sweep of conservatism that has made the liberal label a slur. But in the Canadian sense, his liberalism is rooted in the soil of his father on a farm among the Scots of Elgin County. He was simply Ken Galbraith as a boy. He carved his initials in the old barn door. That was a family farm. That was the front door of the farm. My father, W.A. Galbraith, was, I think it's fair to say, the dominant political force in that part of Ontario. He arranged to have people run for office, supported their election, or sometimes their defeat. And it was my father that encouraged me to get on through high school and go to college. The shaping force of my youth. There were few who were really poor in Elgin County, and very few who were really rich. Galbraith's father insisted that good public policy kept it that way. Everybody to have a concern for how the country was run. Everyone was to have a concern for the great issues. Uh, for his, also, his or her independence of mind. And so you start with the premise that Ken is a small-D Democrat, that his primary audience and concern is for a great middle class in which he thinks that uh, the poor uh, should be made members and in which he frankly thinks that most of the rich should be made members as well too. That democracies thrive when the middle classes are largest and when they have a profound skepticism toward concentrated power and wealth. That's the starting point and it's a very particular kind of Canadian point of view. I started at the Woolies Corner School in Dunwich Township, four or five miles from Dutton, three miles from Iona Station, uh, a definitely rural institution. The problem uh, if I could be a little self-asserting, was that I was passed through class after class very rapidly in order to be rid of me. Galbraith's 95 years have run alongside the history of the 20th century. When he was six, the Great War broke out. At 10, he went to high school. At 12, he heard the first roar of the 20s. Then at 21, the Depression hit. By then, Galbraith was finishing a degree at the Ontario Agricultural College in Guelph, a degree he found exceedingly easy to attain. Then along came a scholarship to study in the United States. A fellowship at the University of California in those days put you well above the level of life at Guelph. I think my father has always had an enormous amount of confidence in himself uh, and in the ability to uh, uh, shape policy, uh, to play a big role in government, and uh, uh, in the and, and later to uh, put forward ideas that would change things. And I think the attraction of the United States was simply that it was and continues to be the biggest stage in the world. In 1931, the California campus at Berkeley was an island surrounded by depression. Galbraith was studying agricultural economics. That and his father's urging to always be involved in the issues of the day spurred Galbraith to study what had gone wrong with America.
What you see is that midway through the Depression, John Maynard Keynes publishes this book called The General Theory. We talked about Keynes at lunch. We talked about Keynes through the afternoon. And then we had a dinner session on Keynes. The emergence of Keynes, combined with Franklin Delano Roosevelt's election, was a critical point of convergence for Galbraith. Government would step in where the free market failed. Roosevelt's era would be one of government spending, so that society could emerge from the desperation of the 1930s. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Keynesian economics begat the New Deal, and John Kenneth Galbraith was right in the middle of it. The, the New Deal was the, the, the greatest period of social change in American history. I mean, almost everything that we live with today in terms of the role of government, the nature of our society, goes back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. What controls production? What controls demand? Uh, what is the effect of prices? That was all the substance of what was taught as agricultural economics. With the New Deal, the new problem came in, how this could be controlled, modified, in order to return, for a simple purpose, in order to return more income to the producers. And that became the center of discussion, including whether it was a good idea or not. Mrs. Lois Jordan started in the small way to help the down and out, and now look at the business she's doing. The New Deal came along because the unbridled rule of big business had gotten the country into a terrific depression. When Roosevelt came in, a quarter of the labor force was out of work. Banks were closing over the country talk of a revolution in the streets and in the rural areas, and the general despair had settled over the country. Roosevelt was going to spend his way out of the Depression by creating jobs with great public works and initiatives. It turned out there was a job for Galbraith, too, in the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. The New Deal brought a desperate shortage of economists. This was an economic problem. It was presumed, rightly or more often wrongly, that economists must have the answer. And so in 1934, after I got a call to give up some teaching in California and come to Harvard, I stopped over in Washington to see what was happening. I arrived one morning and was put on the payroll the next day. Uh, and it was a mark of the urgency and need for economists that nobody asked me where I was a citizen, which I wasn't. Galbraith absorbed the lessons of John Maynard Keynes and became essential to adapting them to the American economy. This doesn't make Galbraith a, uh, a street corner soapbox socialist. He still supports capitalism, but he sees the idea of capitalism as requiring greater uh, public sector supervision. In a very short time, Galbraith had gone from his father's side to the White House. The leap was massive. I to you, the President of the United States. This was a time of rapid change in economics, and uh, the fact that so much of it centered on Washington was one of the things that drew me away from my Canadian background. Ottawa is a lovely city with a lovely location on the river. But the center of change was in Washington.
I had a friend who had been at Smith with me and she, I was having lunch with her in the cafeteria. She introduced me. And I remember turning around and looking up and wondering who would, who would go out with a man that tall. I could see he looked forever out there. So that's how we met. I met Catherine Galbraith and we were married and had our honeymoon in Cambridge, England. That was the toward the end of the decade, just before World War II. We had it from Labor Day until the 17th of September to get ready, packed, all the things you have to do to get married, the license and one thing or another. And uh, we sailed on the 18th. But I, I met his father the day before they came down from Canada. They had a little time to see New York, which they found much more exciting, I think, maybe than the wedding, but they were nice about the wedding. <laughs> he came down to New York to our wedding. We made a tour around New York where he had never been before. And the next day they saw us off. And that was the last time I saw him. In 1938, uh, Ken had been married uh, for just three months. And uh, he had won a prestigious uh, fellowship to uh, go to the University of Cambridge to study with John Maynard Keynes. Uh, in mid-January, uh, his wife Kitty, on her birthday, uh, gets a telegram from Canada, and uh, she's surprised that uh, her in-laws would spend so much money just for her birthday as to send a telegram. But of course the news isn't a uh, happy birthday, it's that Ken's father was killed the day before uh, in a horrible accident. When driving home from a meeting in St. Thomas, crossing the railway track, they were hit by a train, and that was the end. He was 70 years old. I think to this day of him as being an old man, but 25 years younger than I am today. The sadness of his father's death seemed to spur Galbraith on. He had no money to take a steamship home for the funeral. So he stayed and studied at the feet of Keynes. War was on the horizon, and Roosevelt was determined to protect the U.S. economy. So he called on Galbraith. Once Galbraith returned to Washington, he was put in control of all wages and prices in the USA. That meant he could exert his own Keynesian judgment on industry in the halls of high finance. He would not be popular among them. He would control their pricing and profits. He was only 36 and completely in his element. Well, we were all quite young in those days. That was a thought that never crossed my mind. I was young, but I considered myself far superior to older economists who, who were wrong. Galbraith was part of a legion of men who not only worked for the New Deal, but believed in it through and through. Then Franklin Delano Roosevelt died. I had the feeling that the world as I knew it had come to an end. And that was the feeling of my whole generation, that this was a great break. Everybody I knew came to Washington, and we all had the feeling that our world was now blank. These are your neighbors, people like you, 
with time for leisure, time for modern living. These people the post-war prosperity meant Americans had little time for the New Deal. In the village of Half Day, Illinois, near his hometown of Bloomington, Governor Stevenson records his vote after one of the most strenuous campaigns... Meanwhile, Galbraith had never known a Washington without Democrats in the White House. In New York, General Eisenhower signs the register early on the morning of... He had wielded great power, but those days were gone. He campaigned for Adlai Stevenson, but Stevenson was crushed. So was Galbraith. Eisenhower, by a landslide... The greatest plurality of any Republican standard bearer. Depression in Ken's life uh, emerges in periods of crisis, of frustration, and of loss. In 1952, he goes through a profound depression and uh, alienation from the world around him. And he talks about starting to drink heavily, uh, to take pills to, to calm his nerves. Galbraith focused on teaching at Harvard. But even that was difficult now. A conservative board of governors remembered Professor Galbraith's wartime price controls and worked exuberantly to block his tenure. He never would have gotten it had the university president not stepped in. He's a tenured, full professor at Harvard University, and his career, in some sense, is now set. Uh, two months afterwards, he and Kitty are away and the family housekeeper takes the two Galbraith children to the movies. And on the way back from the movies, the younger one, Douglas, begins to complain about how his, his bones hurt and his body hurts and he can't walk. And the housekeeper picks him up and carries him uh, the rest of the way home. My parents didn't know uh, what was wrong. Uh, they, you know, the doctor said rheumatism and uh, you know, variety of other elements, and eventually it was diagnosed as leukemia, which was a, a death sentence in those days. He was a wonderfully bright youngster who had already developed some detached views of his parents' behavior and uh, was widely intelligent, and that was a major blow. It was pretty discouraging, but I, I, that's, that's a, we just get right over that. That's all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. No, it's just my nose running. That's okay. it. I'm not really bursting into tears or anything, but although it's something you don't, just don't get over. That's a, uh, but he was very plucky when that happened. He, uh, He was trying to, the first reaction was to discover anything we could about the disease and what could we do and where could we take him. And then, then we realized that the children's hospital was probably the best place in the world, or as, as good as any. So we stayed back. But that, the com and the whole community were amazingly good to us. And so many people still say, <laughs> I gave blood for your son. It's amazing. The story that uh, one of his students tells is always of uh, Ken coming down the stairs in the morning. Uh, this giant of a man, six foot seven, <clears throat> uh, carrying this little boy um, in, in uh, braces in his arms, um, talking to him, telling him stories to cheer him up. It was, you know, they went through several months of, of decline and, and, uh, uh, and ultimately his death. Um, they tried to make it as, you know, do, do what they could for him. Uh, he w wanted a bicycle for his seventh birthday, which was May 12th. Um, and so uh, my father got him a bicycle and they, they put him on it. But, of course, he, he wasn't strong enough to uh, ride it. But, like all of those things, time acts as a healing agent. And while we always remembered Douglas, or Dougie as he was called, time passed. What happens is that uh, uh, in 1950, in the spring, as Douglas is dying, 
Kitty becomes pregnant uh, with uh, what will be their second, their third son, their second surviving son, who is Peter. And Peter will be born that New Year's uh, Eve. And uh, at the same time, in that same spring, Ken signs uh, a contract with Houghton Mifflin to do American Capitalism, which is his first Galbraithian book. Uh, so you see uh, this kind of attempt to recover in the middle of tragedy, one, by creating a new child, and two, by creating work that will produce an opportunity to live imaginatively someplace other than in the, in the looming tragedy of this child's loss. I think the 1950s was a very self-satisfied, smug, contented decade. And uh, Ken cut loose. He, he raised questions. He criticized the reign of big business. He joshed and kidded the capitalists for their statements and their propositions. And he was a troublemaker of an admirable sort. He was very close to Adlai Stevenson, and he became close to Jack Kennedy. And they were the candidates of the, of the Democratic Party in 52, 56, and 60. And he had great influence on all, all, on all of them, partly because of his height, and partly because of his wit, and partly because of his practical intelligence, and partly because of his enjoyment of politics. So John F. Kennedy, the 43-year-old senator from Massachusetts, becomes president-elect of the United States. In the best JFK manner, one I remember particularly, had to do with my agricultural background. I don't want to hear about agricultural policy from anybody but you, Ken, and I don't want to hear about it from you either. Galbraith had become the outspoken voice of American liberalism with his many books, The New Industrial State, American Capitalism, and his seminal work, The Affluent Society. It made him an easy target for conservatives and a liability for a new president. Truth is that if you're going to be in the White House, you have to be reasonably invisible. And I think Kennedy felt that I had only a limited talent for invisibility. Galbraith had been to India and loved the experience, so he asked to become the American ambassador there. As ambassador, you can be intensely busy, and you can also be intensely idle. And a lot of the times you're idle, you can't be reading a book, but you can be writing one because everybody will think you're taking notes, maybe on their conversation. What he was doing was remembering his childhood jotting down material for The Scotch. The Scotch was supposed to be a loving look back at Elgin County, but it was received there by many as an act of vengeance, aimed at folks who might not have treated Galbraith in the kindest way many years ago. Uh, I didn't like it, no, I didn't like it. In what way, because you know the people involved? Yeah. He was um, a little tough on some families. Tell me, tell me what you had against it. Really, really give it hell. <laughs> Not rubbing, sir. <laughs> <laughs> if you know Galbraith, he tells it like it was. Well, uh, generally speaking, sir, the truth hurts. <laughs> I'm not saying that all those things that he said were right, but I think it was blown out of proportion. They didn't take it in the vein that he meant it in. I got quite a kick out of the book. A lot of people around this territory uh, didn't. Agree with it. <laughs> the surest target was fixed on the next farm over from the Galbraith home. 
The McCallums owned a barn that had permanently fallen into disrepair. In fact, Galbraith wrote, uh, Something of importance fell off his buildings every year and was never mailed back. But he also put in a paragraph where my dad was everyone's best friend. What was the, what was the family reaction in 1964? <laughs> well, much like a lot of the others in the community, uh, they were more disappointed and let down than they were offended. You mentioned some things about people that probably they would have preferred not said. Everyone knew a lot of things. I think you'd agree. A lot of things you said, everyone knew, but it shouldn't be in print. We were brought up with Galbraith could do no wrong at that time. You still can't. <laughs> <laughs> I read the book and just found it. It's the only book of his I've ever been able to read and uh, understand, and uh, I just enjoyed it. Sound that his book's hard to hard to wade through? Oh heavens, yes. If you try and you ever tried to read the Affluent Society, you got to read every paragraph twice. <laughs> That's good. Okay, folks, look this way. They've forgiven him now. They even named the new Dutton Library after Galbraith. We have a new addition to our library wall, a lovely photograph of him in his prime <laughs> that we're going to hang near the collection that we will accumulate of his works. And he is sorry for what he did, mostly. I wasn't thinking of revenge. I was thinking of my chance to restore my own view as opposed to theirs. Galbraith still says it's his favorite of the many books he's written, probably because the exercise of writing was a distraction in an otherwise horrible time. America was getting deeper and deeper into Vietnam, and Galbraith was determined to get the country out any way he could. Yesterday morning, we picked up uh, in one area, uh, I think there were 20 prisoners, and we killed 13. And Vietnam lay between the USA and India, and it was easy for Galbraith, the new U.S. ambassador to the subcontinent, to stop in Saigon mid-trip. A great deal of uh, internal Kennedy uh, memoranda had been declassified in the last five or six years. And what you see is that Galbraith, goes to Kennedy in the spring of 1961. This is within five months of Kennedy taking office and begins to warn Kennedy about Vietnam and then never stops. Galbraith discovers that his old friend Walt Rostow, who's a, an advisor to Kennedy on national security, and General Maxwell Taylor have just returned from Vietnam and are preparing to give Kennedy a, a report. Galbraith goes to Rostow in the White House and says, I want to see this Taylor Commission report before it's given to the president. Rostow looks at him and says, Ken, I can't do this. This is classified top secret, eyes only, president of the United States, the, the, the highest possible classification. Galbraith looks at him and he says, Walt, I've known you for 25 years. I'm a U.S. ambassador with top secret clearance. I want to see the report. Rostow says no. At that moment, the phone rings in Rostow's office, and this is what Rostow does. He leans back to answer the phone. Well, the Taylor Commission report is sitting on Rostow's desk, and Galbraith, from great height, recognizes it, leans forward, picks up the document, and walks out of Rostow's office and the White House while Rostow's back is turned to him. Over the next three days, he writes this blistering critique for Kennedy of the Taylor Commission's recommendations. And what you find is that over the next several days, one, Kennedy orders Galbraith personally to go to Vietnam to inspect the situation and report back to him immediately. 
Second, that Kennedy goes into this top secret meeting with his national security advisors at which the recommendations are uh, put before him and he, following the line that he and Galbraith share, absolutely refuses to commit the troops at that point. Galbraith reinforced Kennedy's skepticism. Kennedy had visited Vietnam as a young congressman in 1950. And he figured that if the French, who had a half a century experience in Vietnam, knew the language, knew the culture, knew all the geography, if, they, if the French crack army could not subdue the energies of nationalism, that it's improbable that the Americans could do it. Although the president is running behind schedule, he pauses momentarily to shake a few hands. I was in New York at Newsweek with Arthur Schlesinger and Kay Graham. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. And uh, we were sitting around the table when a uh, lesser member of the editorial staff tiptoed in. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something and said, I think you should know that the president has been shot. The hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. And for a moment, I thought this was a bad joke. But we rushed to the television sets and turned on, and at last, there was no, no joke. The limousine might have been hit by the gunfire. It was a moment that is still burned in my memory. And uh, Kay Graham had an airplane, and we all got in that, went to Washington, and uh, went to the White House. I was, I was stunned. I was stunned. And the, the, the mixture of shame, rage, and incredulity, and grief. Incredulity because it had taken place, shame that it should have taken place in the United States, rage that this promising life was cut off in the mainstream, and, and uh, It was a tough time. Most of the time was taken on the problems of the, uh, and of the next few days of the funeral. Just commonplace things. The, decision, the church would only hold half the people that would feel entitled to be there. How do you decide which you have and not have a riot outside? And they pressed the tragedy of the day into a sort of second gear when you got through with the things you had to do. John F. Kennedy was, was, had been his congressman, had been his senator, it was his friend. All the people in the Kennedy administration were his associates. He, he had really, uh, you know, arrived. He was in the center of things. This group of very bright people, the best and the brightest, were running, running America, changing the world. And then uh, a few bullets in Texas, and it all ended. And for none of these people, were they ever again to have the kind of role that they had in the Kennedy administration. And, and all of them, including my father, were relatively young when it came to an end. So you can say uh, that a, a single act absolutely changed the course of history. It changed my father's life. It's 
May 1968, Saigon, and they're talking about peace in Paris. But here, the night shudders to the rumble of artillery in the distance. What happens in the 1970s in the United States, in the wake of the Vietnam War, in the wake of civil rights, in the wake of the war on poverty, in the wake of the counterculture, is essentially a counter-revolution. A counter-revolution that begins under Richard Nixon and then grows in, uh, to full flower um, under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And the battle cry of these people is to turn back government. That somehow the balance that the liberals had sought had gotten totally uh, had gone totally wrong, that it was a world in which the government had too much power, in which business had too little freedom, in which individuals and companies were too constrained by regulation and too overtaxed. And this new narrative took hold. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. I never was as pessimistic in the time of the Republicans after FDR as I have been in the last year or two. Uh, maybe that is age, but uh, the economic prospect, for example, it has been dismal. George W. Bush represents something completely different. Uh, first, there is the way in which he came to office, which I think many Americans, including my father, simply can't forget. He didn't win. You know, for those who believe in, in America, who believe in government, who believe that there's a certain fairness, I think that was fundamentally shocking. And then coming into office, uh, there's simply the, the naked service of, of the wealthy as reflected in these tax cuts. The naked service of, of corporate interests as reflected uh, in, the, in the removal of regulations and the rollback of, of environmental regulations. And then uh, a, a, a nakedly aggressive foreign policy as expressed in the doctrines of preemption. I never thought that I would one day yearn for Ronald Reagan. My biggest source of regret is seeing us on this venture in Iraq, a very ill-considered step, one that has stirred a large feeling not different from that of the venture in Vietnam. Galbraith has been on the outside of Washington looking in since the death of his friend, John F. Kennedy. He received a Medal of Freedom from President Clinton, but had little to do with economic policy. And he's certainly not receiving any calls now from the current occupant of the White House. My economic instruction began in the depth of the Great Depression, and that has left me with the sense that things can and do get better. And I still have that hope. I've always contented myself with trying to do what might be possible for the issues within the Democratic Party for which I felt the strongest need. The test of economic progress that uh, I have always thought important, and that is a perceptible level of groans from the very fortunate. I didn't want to stir up anger, but uh, if they applauded me, I would have been uneasy.
Well, I am David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Kennedy School of Government, and so it, uh, it was really terrific to watch a video of such a uh, remarkable, humble, small in stature man. Uh, he was a man of, uh, as uh, Richard Parker loves to say, oversized. Um, I'm also, again, very pleased that uh, Kitty can be here and, and Jamie and Peter. It's, uh, it's a great, great honor to have you here. Now, one of the things that I want to comment on very briefly is actually the very close connection that Ken Galbraith had with the Kennedy School. Uh, he obviously had a very close connection with John F. Kennedy. We are obviously named after John F. Kennedy. And so perhaps to start that, it would be best actually to show a few words spoken um, by John F. Kennedy. He won by a slim margin, um, and Senator Ted Kennedy often credits um, Ken Galbraith as having a pretty significant role in that. So here are a couple of excerpts from John F. Kennedy's inaugural speech. Negotiate. Can we show that again? Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. So those are words that almost everyone in this audience would recognize, and obviously they were spoken by a remarkable leader. They are certainly timeless. Uh, the first 100 days is a concept that every leader thinks about. But what's even more remarkable, of course, is they were written by John Kenneth Galbraith. He's the author of those and many other of the great words of uh, uh, President Kennedy and many other concepts that were here. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, Ken Galbraith was deeply involved in was, in fact, the founding of the modern-day Kennedy School. Uh, he was one of the people that was most close to the Kennedy family more generally. And so he took a really significant role in help guiding the creation of the Kennedy School and the Institute of Politics. And uh, he was also the kind of scholar who brought really extraordinary intellect, but a real pragmatic uh, and a real great desire to make a difference that ultimately, we believe, characterizes the Kennedy School at its best. I did note, by the way, in that program, he reported something that I have never, ever heard another human being utter. He said there was, at the time, a desperate shortage of economists. Um, <laughs> As an economist, I'm happy to hear that there was, at least at one time, such a thing. Perhaps it was a particular <laughs> kind of economist. Uh, he came and spent, uh, he spoke here um, almost a dozen times, and uh, he certainly was involved in many various ways. I actually got to know, got to see Ken Galbay first as a graduate student when he had created a prize in the economics department for the best teacher. And it was uh, something that the, un, the graduate students uh, were supposed to select the best teacher. And then there was a special event at his home. And well, of course, one of the main things he would speak about is the fact that he created this because it's certainly something he himself would never have been worthy of. Uh, Ken was not necessarily known for his spectacular teaching, but he certainly admired those who did it and wanted to reward those who, who uh, were such extraordinary teachers. Later, when we created a program here for young um, uh, people who might become interested in the study of public policy, particularly people of color, we created a program called the Galbraith Fellows. It's a program that continues today. And this happened relatively late in Ken Galbraith's life. And it was a, something that he was always very excited about because it was always about the future with him, always about a new opportunity. The Galbraith Fellows were always invited to the house. Galbraith would appear at dinners. And even in the, latest, in the later years when you could, uh, he could hardly hear and indeed would almost at times seem to be dozing off, as soon as there was a chance for him to get up and speak, he'd tell the story of the ants and the horse manure and a hundred other stories to inspire the young people. 
So it's now appropriate and uh, that we honor this man. And uh, uh, I want to st- uh, turn it over now to Richard Parker. Um, he uh, worked first as an, he's a, an economist also by training, something I've, I'm not sure he'll often admit. Um, he worked as an economist for uh, UNDP and is a co-founder of actually of Mother Jones Magazine. Um, his the biography itself. Uh, as I assume everyone in this room knows, is called John Kenneth Galbraith, His Life, His Politics, His Economics. And so with that, let me turn it over to Richard and let us begin. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for that very nice set of comments and that introduction. What we're going to do tonight is carry on a conversation for a while among those of us here on the stage and then We're going to invite you to join that conversation with your questions. There are microphones here and here, and there may be microphones up above I can't see uh, up there. And uh, we hope that you will not only come better to appreciate John Kenneth Galbraith, but the issues that drove him as an American liberal that we need to ask ourselves today. Let me start by asking the panel first, what has changed about American liberalism since the middle of the 20th century when Ken was at his height. I looked down the row, and I think all of you could answer it, but I think I'm going to ask Alan to take a first shot at it since he's such a distinguished historian of the 20th century. Well, it's hard to know how to begin to answer that question. Um, The most obvious question, the most obvious change in the condition of liberalism since Ken Galbraith was at the peak of his career in the 50s and 60s is its dismal political state. Uh, in the in the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so, but I think a, a better question, uh, perhaps, or a better way to answer that question is to think of the issues uh, that liberals face today uh, that are different from those they faced uh, a generation or two ago. And I can think of uh, three, two of them relatively new, at least uh, in in our conception, and third, an enduring issue that uh, has. Uh, it continues to be uh, unaddressed by our political world. The first, and I think, at least in the short term, by far the most important issue uh, that faces liberals today, not one that Ken Galbraith faced in the 50s and 60s, although, of course, he published his last book, what, two years ago? Mm-hmm. So there aren't many issues uh, <laughs> that he didn't address himself, <laughs> um, <coughs> including this one. but. I think the, the most important issue facing the country in the short term, uh, and particularly facing Democrats in this election, is the war in Iraq. Uh, this misconceived venture uh, that I consider the greatest foreign policy failure uh, since Vietnam. Uh, and of course, there is a, a foreign policy structure that undergirds this war uh, that if reinforced over time uh, could lead us into even greater disasters. So it seems to me that one of the great challenges uh, facing liberals today after many, many decades of a fairly consistent bipartisan foreign policy uh, is to come up with an alternative uh, in this new era uh, to the foreign policy that is now uh, governing our, our nation's role in the world. The second issue uh, that is also in some ways new and uh, not yet perhaps getting as much attention as it deserves, or getting more attention uh, than it once did, is uh, the environment. Uh, and the, uh, the growing sense of a, what we might call a looming environmental holocaust uh, that if not addressed uh, faces perhaps not us, but our children or grandchildren, uh, and threatens the very future of the world. Um, This is something that should not be a political issue, but of course it is a political issue. Uh, And it's an issue that is addressed very directly and very misleadingly by the right uh, and has not yet been adopted, I think, in any significant way, or at least in significant enough way, uh, by liberals and by the left. And then the third issue uh, that is, um, I think, in in domestic terms, uh, a sort of underlies many of the problems that we face, uh, and and probably the most intractable problem uh, facing our country, is growing levels of inequality. Uh, For the last 30 years, uh, inequality has 
we have, there's never been equality, economic equality in the United States, and, and that's an impossible goal. Uh, but there were reasonably stable levels of, of equality, inequality uh, until the mid 1970s, uh, uh, since since which time inequality has been steadily growing, uh, and uh, that inequality can be measured in in any range of ways, in economic status, in access to education, health care, um, could go on and on. Uh, Inequality is a fundamental underpinning of our domestic life, uh, and yet it's an issue that neither, neither party nor the voters themselves uh, seem to have any interest in. Uh, I don't know the answer to how to make that issue uh, one that people pay attention to, nor do I have an answer to how you actually address inequality, which is certainly being exacerbated by the policies of this administration, but were not created by this administration or by any administration, but were, have been created by uh, fundamental changes in the global economy. So those three issues seem to me to be at the heart of what liberalism faces today, uh, not entirely different from issues that Ken Galbraith faced uh, through his uh, career, but um, different in form and perhaps different in their urgency. Thank you, Alan. I want to ask Samantha and Peter, both of whom work on foreign policy, and Peter's recently published a very well-received book on Iraq. What, what is a liberal foreign policy for the next five years? What are the tenets that we should be concentrating on in trying to articulate a liberal foreign policy in, in your father's tradition? Well, <clears throat> I think the, the, the fundamental point about my father's view of foreign policy is that he was a realist. He saw the world as it was. I said earlier today, and I'll repeat it, in the, in the Cold War, uh, the, the distinction between liberals and conservatives is that the conservatives believed in communism. Uh, that is to say, they believed it was an all-powerful ideology. This is perhaps best represented by Jean Kirkpatrick and the neoconservatives. She actually argued that if a country became communist, it was lost forever. That's how powerful she thought communism was. Whereas my father uh, will, went to the Soviet Union. He saw it for what it was. He didn't think that we should have nuclear war with the Soviets or any kind of war. He saw that this was a system that was going to to, to, that, that its own internal contradictions were going to lead to reform. And of course, uh, and, and therefore, ventures like Vietnam, uh, expending billions of dollars and tens of thousands of lives to determine whether villages were communist or capitalist, and where he pointed out didn't really make it, you couldn't tell on the ground, that that was pure folly. Uh, and so, uh, and of course, in the end, uh, his view was uh, vindicated. Today, we have a, a, an administration uh, that has operated in a world of fantasy. The, first, it scared itself to death about uh, Iraq, uh, or at least try, and tried to scare the country. Uh, I mean, I, I thought Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, uh, or chemical weapons. I documented their use. Uh, but uh, the notion that it had we weapons that could threaten us, clearly it didn't have nuclear okay. weapons. But the second was, was, the, was, was something very aggressive, and I think this is different from, in fact, I, I wouldn't even describe this as a conservative administration, it's really a radical administration, and they had this radical vision that, uh, that the United States could topple the regime in Iraq, that the Iraqis were the Germans of the Middle East, that they would embrace democracy, and, and then in turn, this would topple regimes in Iran and Syria. And you had Paul Wolfowitz, for example, arguing that the Shiites in Iraq, uh, because they had the holy places and because they were going to be in a Western libera country liberated by the United States, would become a subversive force to undermine the Iranians. Uh, now, it was a very nice argument, uh, just had no connection to reality. Uh, if you sort of looked at it, you might have noticed that the largest and uh, Shiite political party was the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. That name didn't exactly hint at secularism. Uh, and of course, it was founded by Iran and is to this day funded by Iran, and that's the moderate one. Now, so you, you had this, this sort of radical vision. And I think my, my father would have 
and, and I think what liberals ought to do is say, hey, we're, 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 gonna, we're not going to live in the world of fantasy. We're going to live in the world as it is. Uh, we, we're not, we're not gonna, we can't be in the business of um, you know, trying to find magic wand solutions or changing the Middle East in this way. Uh, and then the second thing I would think he would say for a, a liberal foreign policy goes back to that quote uh, of, of President Kennedy's, the, in, in Kennedy's inaugural that he penned. Uh, we, we should never uh, uh, negotiate out of fear, but we should never fear to negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have an administration that is, some, that, uh, uh, that is somehow fearful that the North Koreans are going to take them to the cleaners, or the Iranians <laughs> are going to out, outsmart them. With this crowd, of course, I suppose that's possible. But, uh, but, but in reality, uh, North Korea and uh, Iran are not going to get the better of us in a bargain. Uh, but uh, we, we, we've, we've had a lot of, lot of tough talk from the administration. It's totally unacceptable for North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Of course they do. We're not going to do anything. In Texas, isn't that called all hat, no cattle? <laughs> um, Jamie's in Texas. But anyhow, uh, well, if you don't have a military option, and, and your, uh, uh, your bluster hasn't worked, then possibly you might want to try something else, like negotiating. <laughs> Samantha. Um, I was just thinking about um, something we touched upon earlier in the day, but about the um, importance of really grasping the interconnectedness of uh, domestic politics and of foreign policy. And, um, you know, when one sort of contrasts the Kennedy moments of, you know, ask not what you, and, and then with, go shopping. <laughs> um, that's what you can do, go shopping. Um, you know, or pay those gas prices. Uh, that'll, you know, support the world as it is, not the world as we will even deign um, to dream it can be. Um, I think it's really, really important that I mentioned one example of this earlier, um, the degree to which what goes on inside our democracy in this increasingly visible uh, moment where everything the Bush says to appease a domestic constituency is broadcast instantly um, into the quarters that we're trying to reach where our soft power, our legitimacy, our perceptions of competence, of our competence to do the job abroad have dropped so dramatically. Um, but understanding that a domestic debate where Karl Rove has actually decided, this is the amazing thing about the torture debate in this country, nothing, well, apart from the disaster of Iraq, <laughs> um, the, 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 the implementation, almost nothing that this administration does as political strategy happens by accident. It's very well thought out. Karl Rove made the judgment that being against the Geneva Conventions and for a variety of practices that most of, many of us in this room, many would, and certainly can, would have found abhorrent, but Rove made the judgment that that was sound political strategy in advance of the November election, mm -hmm. that that was actually a good wedge issue in our society. And you know, hopefully he won't be proven right, or maybe we'll never know what the Foley scandal, whether that would have, would have worked. But to not grasp that what goes on when we have those debates about do we waterboard or don't we, that that goes immediately to Al Jazeera, that the unwillingness to close down Guantanamo, you know, the unwillingness in the US Senate to hold hearings about our detention policies, never mind um, to try to exercise the kind of oversight that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee of yesteryear um, uh, exercised. But the ways that, that these gaps between our rhetoric about democratization and freedom and then these very real domestic debates were happen, you know, that, that are happening. I think that's on the one hand. And then cutting in the other direction, what we talked about earlier, not having the adult conversation with the American people about what will be required to sustain the kind of engagement that will be required in societies that aren't pretty. Um, I mean, even the ones that we shouldn't have gone, the, the ones we shouldn't have gone into, and then there's the ones um, that really need shoring up that, you know, will constitute long-term threats if we don't tend to, and, and figuring out how to get out of Iraq, even getting out is going to take huge uh, resources. But all the singular challenges, whether foreign aid and, 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 and the like, or freeing ourselves of the energy dependence that leaves us so vulnerable to some of these regimes, all of these are going to require citizen action. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not a conversation. I mean, go shopping isn't going to cut it. And you're seeing, especially among progressives, and again, we touched on this earlier, 
But a real tendency, because of the lack of candor and the lack of, uh, I mean, just so much of what's come out of the White House, but a temptation to throw baby out with, with bathwater and, and to think that there is such thing as neutrality. You know, we, we shouldn't be doing democratization. There is such thing as neutrality in dealings with foreign powers, you know, that we can simply turn back the clock and that there's a neutral relationship with Uzbekistan possible, even though they boil people to death. Uh, or that we can be neutral on Saudi Arabia and therefore avoid both the charges of intermeddling and the charges of abetting. But the reality is some attention to what goes on in these societies is indispensable. And yet many people have been so burned by the consequences of this largely rhetorical freedom agenda that they're giving up on, on, that, on, on humane foreign policy altogether. So we're really at a moment where, where accountability is so necessary, if only uh, to have the debate, I mean, for, for course correction, and for reclaiming the constituency that will be needed for the long haul, because this is a long haul. EJ, I want to have you pick up on what Samantha's been saying, because she connects international policy and domestic policy, and in particular domestic politics with our international behavior. And, <laughs> You're uh, in Washington and a columnist for the Washington Post. And you said something very intriguing this afternoon, which is you have a felt sense that something about this world of the last 30 years is coming to an end or coming apart. Would you say a little bit more about that? Uh, th uh, thank you for remembering that. The, um, I, this afternoon I spoke about how two of uh, the favorite columns I've written, favorite judged by reader response and email, one was headlined, The End of the Bush Era, and one was headlined, The End of the Right. Now, as I told everyone this afternoon, that got emailed around a lot, not because of the brilliant Galbraithian quality of my prose, but because lots and lots of people devoutly hoped I was right. Um, <laughs> but I do think that we are at the end of a very long conservative era that is starting to run into some of the very problems that were perceived, at least in liberalism in the 1960s. Uh, that there's a kind of exhaustion, that there's a kind of arrogance, mm -hmm. and that the sort of the basic building blocks of this coalition aren't fitting together anymore, and the contradictions in the policy are becoming glaring, the most obvious being a small government party that wants to cut taxes but is unwilling to cut public expenditure, especially on a war and on, on the military, uh, contradictions between the uh, its business coalition and its uh, socially conservative wing, uh, a, a contradiction, right? Uh, we won't even talk about how many contradictions we can count in the Foley uh, matter. Um, <laughs> and then a disastrous war that was, that's been uh, discussed. I just want to go back, if I could, for a second to your first question, though. You know, when you asked what's different about liberalism now, I was struck by the boldness, even at ages 95 and however old Arthur Schlesinger is, the boldness of their defense of liberalism and the sense that they had as liberals uh, of being part of a proud legacy. Um, right now, if a liberal is asked to defend liberalism, the bold, gutsy, courageous response is, what do you mean? I'm not a liberal. Um, and I think that that, that is the product of um, a very long period of conservative dominance that has led to a kind of liberal timidity. And last point is two things I was struck by in the film, two lines. Galbraith had never known Washington without a Democratic president when uh, Roosevelt died. Um, and you know, when you think about it, we have had, depending on how you want to count it, a 38-year conservative era beginning in 68, interrupted by Carter and Clinton, or a 26-year um, conservative era interrupted by Clinton alone. Um, and I think that has created a, a sort of political climate that now I believe the very length of it and the arrogance is falling apart. Um, and the other thing is, this film was dominated by Keynes and Roosevelt. And our era's economics has been dominated by Friedman and Reagan. Um, and that I think Bob Reich, who used to teach here, uh, made a very good point many, many years ago that liberalism was undergirded uh, by a sense of solidarity that was created during the Depression uh, and the war. Um, Galbraith said, my economic instruction began in the depths of the Great Depression. Um, and that that period was a period of great confidence in government's capacities 
uh, and a rather significant skepticism of the private sector, which many, as the film suggested, had seen people, had, had been seen to lead the country uh, into calamity. Uh, we've gone through a very long period where exactly the opposite is true. It's as if we're coming out of the McKinley-Coolidge era. Right. Um, and I think that, I, as I say, if I am right about this uh, conservatism losing steam, which I, Mike Royko, the great columnist for the Chicago Tribune, had one of my favorite book titles. It was a collection of his columns, and that book was called I Could Be Wrong, But I Doubt It. So if I am right about this, then I, I just wish Ken Galbraith could have lived another 10 years, because I think we will be looking at a very different political era 10 years from now. Jamie, I want you to pick up on the third point that Alan raised this evening about growing inequality. A lot of your economics career has been focused on inequality, both domestically and internationally. And maybe you could tie those two dimensions together for I'll, us. I'll, I'll come to that, but I, I want to begin where you did with the question of how uh, the context has changed mm -hmm. over the past 40 years. Uh, in 1967, uh, my father published The New Industrial State. And I think it was in 1973, he published a book called Economics and the Public Purpose. The first book dealt with the corporation, and the second largely with the state. And he had a realistic view of both of them. Uh, the corporation he thought, in its existence, uh, necessitated a new economics, an economics of organization. It was a devastating critique of the conventional economics of competitive markets that it simply could not cope with the existence of a corporate economy. Uh, but he wasn't opposed to corporations as such. He felt that they were an absolutely essential part of any advanced industrial system. And as for the state, he maintained throughout, and it was evident in this film, an optimism about the capacity of the state in the right hands with the right policies to come to the relief of the private sector, uh, to work in partnership with the private sector, and to produce something uh, that was better than either a uh, atomistic free market economy would be alone. That was a disaster that had shown itself to be disastrous in 1929 or that a state centrally planned economy alone could be, again, as Peter said, something he knew was not viable when he saw it in the Soviet Union. Well, what happened uh, over the past 20 years? One is that, 30 years, Ronald Reagan, beginning in 1980, launched what he thought was an attack on the power of unions, on the power of the forces behind the Democratic Party. But in that attack, he did an enormous amount of damage to the corporate system, to the manufacturing base of the country, uh, to the structure of the economy as it then existed. And the result of that, by and large, was globalization. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, just at the time when, among others, China was building a uh, vast machine to export products to the world, and particularly <coughs> the United States, the United States was restructuring itself to uh, accommodate and even demand uh, imports on a vast scale. And as a result, uh, for that and other reasons, including financial linkages, you emerged at the end of this period with an economy that was not national in scope, but global. Um, it also destabilized the internal structure and governance of the corporation, creating a world, and this touches on part of the inequality issue that uh, Alan raised, in which it was possible for corporate chief executives uh, to uh, loot their companies and to loot their shareholders uh, for their own benefit with very few of the um, checks and balances and controls. In the new industrial state, Dad argued that the corporation would control this because it was necessary for the survival of the corporation. But with the strains and pressures that the corporation was put under in the 80s uh, and through into the 90s, uh, those uh, the capacity of what he called the technostructure to keep the corporation intact as a producing entity was greatly reduced. And the result was you got raiders. You got raiders from the inside who in many cases completely subverted the uh, manufacturing or other corporation uh, and created a kind of plutocratic class, uh, which uh, again emerged as an enormously powerful force behind the present administration. 
And then on the side of government, the vast cre uh, uh, creation of middle class programs, uh, which grew up in the New Deal, Social Security, the housing guarantee programs, uh, health care, which emerged in Lyndon Johnson's time, uh, created a world which I think we talked about this afternoon, uh, is in many ways more efficient in providing certain kinds of insurance and certain kinds of services than the private market can be. Social Security's costs are much lower than private life insurance or uh, pension funds costs are. Uh, but at the same time, creates a target for predators, a target for economic interests for whom this becomes an enormously attractive opportunity if they can get the right political leverage to tap into what a friend of mine once called the Mississippi of cash flows, the social security uh, trust funds, uh, or to tap into the uh, <coughs> Medicare uh, uh, flows by the means of the, of the drug benefit, which was constructed in such a way as to deliver a massive uh, flow of, of revenue to the, to the big pharmaceutical companies. And what we have in this administration, EJ is quite right, it's the complete evanescence of a free market conservative ideology. It's not something that anybody even inside the government, I think, takes seriously anymore. People who do take it seriously were all writing in the Washington Monthly uh, about how the Republicans should be defeated in these next elections. Uh, what we have is a, what is big government conservatism. Uh, in, or it's not even really conservatism. Peter describes it as a, as a radicalism. I describe it as a government in, this, in the predatory service of a very small number uh, of, of interests, of clientele, of constituents, uh, who have beset, essentially, the great social machine that Roosevelt created. Um, and that's a context that's going to have to be dealt with by the next generation of liberals. You're going to have to have a system of governance uh, for the corporation that is, goes beyond having laws that are prosecuted eventually, but that actually makes organizations viable and in the service of the, of the larger economy. You're going to have to have a system of government that is freed of this kind of, of, um, of, of predatory uh, assault. And you have to have to clear accounting for the assault that has already taken place. That seems to me to be a very large part of the Could task. I just say that Please. Jamie's... Uh, whole predatory language shows that he is his father's son. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that the Social Security is a very interesting case in point about why I think the right has hit its limits. Mm -hmm. uh, because this was a direct assault on the core program of the New Deal. Uh, and this didn't fail for lack of salesmanship. The more the plan was described, the more faith the public lost in it. It was a genuine public debate and the side of privatization lost. And I think one of the reasons it lost um, is, has, is well described by Jacob Hacker in his new book, where we are talking about a period in which more and more risk is being thrown onto the back of the individual, and that risks that used to be assumed either by government or by uh, something we don't really think about that much but was vital to our public life, a kind of corporate welfare state, where for many, many employees in the United States, their corporations could be counted on to provide health care at relatively low cost to the employee and stable guaranteed pensions. Guaranteed pensions are a thing of the past. Health care is in great danger. And so I think that the country took a look at this and said, we already have enough risk in our lives. We don't want to assume yet more risk on this small piece of our retirement that's guaranteed. And I think that's sort of one indication. Then Katrina, of course, is the other where there was a popular demand that government act, uh, that the government both be active and be effective, and it was neither. Let me come back to that question yeah. of inequality because I, I do want to say a word about that. We did some calculations um, on, uh, enabled us to pinpoint specifically where at least a large part of the rise in inequality in the late 1990s which, after all, was under a democratic administration, right. occurred. Uh, and the answer is it's substantially um, accounted for by the technology boom. Uh, it is a product of the enormous inflation of asset values in, um, uh, in information technology firms and the stock options and capital gains that were realized there. And it was concentrated in a tiny handful of places in the country. It's really remarkable. If you take out three counties in Northern California, um, including uh, 
Santa Clara, I mean Silicon Valley, uh, King County, Washington, and Manhattan, then a great part of the rise in inequality that you measure actually goes away. So th that, 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 that's an interesting result, but it, we've, we've recently redone the so calculation. So we're living in the wrong county here. You de definitely are, but, we, but, but that has gone away. That is, that, <coughs> the bubble burst and the incomes in those areas have deflated. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the question, which counties have, where is the new wealth creation concentrated in this administration in the last five years, uh, which we, again, a calculation we just did, uh, you, can, you get a very interesting answer. The answer is Montgomery County, Maryland, Prince George's County, Maryland, Arlington County, Virginia, Fairfax County, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. This government has built wealth in K Street at the Pentagon and in the immediate clientele of the federal government and basically not elsewhere in the country. I want to open this up as a conversation to those of you in the audience. Why don't you step up and I'd, if you have questions, please try to be succinct and realize that there are people behind you who may have questions as well. Uh, yes. Fred, Fred Meyer, uh, I wonder um, if anyone would like to comment on his friendship, I think it was a friendship with an ideological opposite, William F. Buckley. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Buckley, his, his friendship with Buckley. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it was a <coughs> extraordinarily warm friendship. Uh, began, uh, I guess, in Switzerland, uh, in Gestad, where both of them went for the winter to write. Uh, lively debate, mutual respect. Uh, and I suppose the uh, current point is that, uh, I, I mean, my father always tried to convert uh, Bill. Uh, I don't suppose Bill ever thought that he could possibly convert my father. Um, but at the end of the day, I think uh, it's fair to say that Bill Buckley does not think that this is a conservative administration or represents the values that he represents. I would say, too, that this underlying this friendship was a deep love of the English language, which they shared, mm -hmm. uh, and a clarity of thought and prose, which they admired in each other. Uh, Bill at the memorial said he was syntactically pure, which was a lovely phrase. Uh, and I should also say that there was an element, of, I mean, it's just a personal devotion at the end, that Bill, uh, I think every two months, took the train from um, Stanford up to, came, yeah. to Boston, yeah. came in right. for lunch, yeah. uh, and would, 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 would chat with Dan and mother for a couple of hours and then go back and take the train back home at a time when he was physically not, yeah. not, in, not in the best of shape. So it was a very, very devoted friendship based on some very deep shared values. Over here. Hi, my name is Ben Bolcher, and I'm a grad student um, at Harvard. Recognizing that John Kenneth Galbraith was generally optimistic about the future, we've seen an increase in shareholder activism in corporations to promote greater socially responsible behavior of corporations, particularly doing business abroad in areas of conflict zones. Um, I was wondering if you're generally optimistic about that trend and its effectiveness in providing um, uh, effective solutions to conflicts. I'd direct that to uh, Professor Power or to any other people uh, that would like to address that. Um, I don't, I mean, on the, on the it's, it's, um, it's a tricky moment right now. I mean, one of the examples of that, just that I do know something about, is of course the divestment movement on Darfur, uh, which has forced corporations, some corporations have done it voluntarily, sometimes it's been, Shareholders that have pressed it, often um, it's coming out of domestic political processes. Um, and then you run up against <laughs> the minor problem um, that uh, no countries uh, other than the United States are remotely interested in holding Sudan accountable for its behavior. So other companies are using this. It's basically a windfall for um, Chinese and French uh, oil operations uh, because they have the pick of the litter to themselves. So part of the challenge in general is to the degree that that activism, that shareholder activism grows out of a 
civic education or a kind of injection of a human rights of human rights into the political culture here, which is you know a relatively recent phenomenon, but a trend that was going in that direction at least until recently, seemingly. Um, again, if one thinks about culturally. Um, one looks for evidence of similar trends in other countries. You're certainly, you know, uh, up against an awfully big wall uh, in China. I mean, you can't even imagine um, corporate executives bringing that sensibility um, to boardroom discussions. The question is, are there transnational movements then that can create branding issues in other markets that would make render it advantageous, not only for the corporations but also for the Chinese government to begin to integrate regard for some of these principles. But this, this moment, and I, I thought about it when Richard asked the original question, which I thought we were all going to answer about, you know, how is it different? I mean, remembering the degree to which liberalism of any form and its components, but just how different this world is. I mean, when one thinks about the 60 countries that made up the UN at its founding, you know, and 192 countries that make up the UN today, um, and the difference, I mean, in, in I mean, 123 of whom are members of the G77 self-identify as countries of the South in opposition, you know, in, on, on, on many, many issues from, you know, trade to human rights and, and interventionism and all of that. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a different building, it's a different world into, into which we bring whatever emerges from our democratic experiment. <laughs> Um, you know, we're up against, a, it's a very different complexion and, and Kennedy's ability to, you know, to, I mean, even that bipolarity, the ability to summon and to speak for one set of principles when there might have been another on the other side of the ledger, I mean, there's much more of a cacophony now in, in that court of public opinion, much more noise. Great. You know, Galbraith grew up at a time <coughs> when uh, investment in the stock market was called speculation. Uh, and I think that did affect his view of a lot of these questions. It, just if I can briefly tell the great story he tells in The Great Crash, one of his most entertaining books, when he put out a new edition of that book, uh, he said, like all writers, he likes to see if they're in bookstores, and he goes into an airport bookstore, looks for a copy of The Great Crash, asks the person at the desk, who says in that airport bookstore, oh, sir, we would not stock a book with that title in this place. Um, and I think one of the things he, he, he would probably understand better than most conservatives want to is that this is much more of a mixed economy than we realize. And to me, the long-term success of the shareholder movement depends upon the ability and willingness of two large groups of capital owners, one public pension funds and the other union pension funds dwindling with all, because of all the economic problems we've described uh, to play in that sphere. And you've seen cases where they may not have won the fights they picked, but they were surely able to change the issues discussed. And I don't see any reason that won't continue unless, as there's been some pressure on this in California, the lid is put, if you will, the free speech rights of public pension funds start getting restricted and then uh, this movement, I think, would have much less of a future. So I hope that doesn't happen. I, think the I just want to also say, I think the shareholder movement is a good example of Galbraith's old idea of countervailing powers. One of the his best ideas. That 50, the 50 years ago, 90% of stock was held by private individuals. Today, 70% of stock is held by institutions, mainly pension funds and mutual funds. And what is most interesting about the shareholder movement is that it has come to act as a countervailing power acting on these corporations. So. Jamie. No, I just, only to say that which, uh, in the time when my father was writing, given the fact that it was largely individuals, he never had any confidence that shareholders could make much of a right. difference. Up here. Yeah, my name is Bernard Marguerite. Uh, I used to be a correspondent for Le Monde in Eastern Europe and a former fellow at the Kennedy School. Uh, Professor Galbraith was kind enough to give me an interview about 13 years ago. And he said that uh, he is a uh, horrified by the way the new democracy in Eastern Europe are moving uh, toward what he said, a, a wild capitalism. Uh, a kind, he said, we, we will would not accept in America. That was before the Bush uh, years. <laughs> um, and then uh, when I observed that uh, they are mainly following the advices of a Harvard man, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, 
he smiled very gently and said, well, Jeffrey is a young man, he will grow up. So just to show that uh, Professor Galbraith was also a very kind man. But <laughs> most importantly, I, I would like to thank you very much because from uh, particularly maybe somebody who is coming from France, you know, this is a, a small country, uh, the home of the Freedom Fries. Um, <laughs> It is sometimes uh, difficult nowadays to keep alive uh, your love for this country. And uh, when you see uh, this video, when you hear this debate, when you read your book, uh, Richard, uh, it makes so much easier to still love this country. So many thanks for that. You know, it shows us that the best in America is still the best in the world. That the teaching of Professor Galbraith is not something of the past, not even of the present, but it is the future. It is an example for us, and it is an inspiration. And thank you very much for all that. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say, um, we had a, a lunch with my father, uh, I guess a, a year before he died, and he expressed some of his uh, thoughts, uh, that things he might want mentioned at a memorial service, and he did say that he wanted, that he wanted it known that it was still possible to have good relations with uh, other countries, at least with Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Up here. My okay. name is Eric Weltman, and I live here in Cambridge, and I have an exceedingly simple and brief question for anyone and everyone who cares to answer. What is liberalism? Alan's written a book about that. Go ahead. <laughs> I, the question, well, liber what, is, what exactly is liberalism? Well, liberalism is, first of all, one of the great political traditions of the last uh, 300 years. Uh, but it's taken many different forms in the United States. Uh, it's very hard to, f for a idea that has been out of power for as long as liberalism <laughs> has to describe exactly what it stands for today. But I think in the period from the New Deal until sometime in the 80s, uh, liberalism was an effort to meld uh, the traditional liberal commitment to individual freedom to the idea of a fluid society not controlled by inherited wealth and hierarchy, uh, and a, a, a almost libertarian vision of economic and, and social life, an effort to meld that with a sense in the early 20th century of the perils to individual freedom uh, that had emerged from the, the growth of great centers of power, at that point corporations primarily, uh, and I think through the 20th century, liberalism has been an effort to uh, strike a balance between its commitment to liberty and its commitment to sustaining conditions under which liberty could survive, which, in, which entailed, liberals have believed, a much enhanced power for government uh, to do that. That would be my definition. Others may have other Jamie, Jamie, ones. You, Jamie, you oh, have something you want to say? And then, simple and then question <laughs> deserves, deserves a very simple answer. I would say liberalism is the intellectual tradition of Arthur Schlesinger and John Kenneth Galbraith. <laughs> <laughs> can I? Can I? Can I please. EJ, why don't you, yeah, you let EJ, EJ, let, you yeah, let EJ no, take that, a shot. I mean, I think part of the problem with the word liberalism is it's had so many meanings. Historically, liberals uh, in Europe still are associated with the political freedom we associate with liberalism here and uh, a view of economic freedom that is much more akin to what uh, American conservatives uh, proclaim. Herbert Hoover called himself a liberal. Uh, and that liberalism sort of underwent transformations in Britain the new liberals came along and said government can be used to enhance individual opportunity and individual liberty, and we're kind of the precursors of the American liberals. We used to call people, who, in a way, liberalism is social democracy light. Uh, we used to call people who uh, are, were called liberal in the Galbraith generation progressive, and we've gone back to that word 
because the great old liberal word has been uh, discredited. Um, in this afternoon, and I don't have it in front of me, I love Galbraith's uh, own view that essentially liberals are in favor of those with weak bargaining positions, and conservatives tend to support those with strong bargaining positions, or as I like to think of it, uh, liberals are for the people trying to get up, and conservatives are trying to, are for the people who are already up. But that may sound too Carvillian for some in the room, but I still like that definition myself. Can I, can I just add one, <laughs> one also, because I think Ken was the first person um, who introduced, since we're in Massachusetts, this seems worth saying, but who introduced me to Representative Barney Frank's definition of a conservative. Maybe it was you, Peter. I think it was your dad. Um, and that is the definition of a conservative, of course, is one whose regard for human life begins at the moment of conception and ends at the moment of birth. Um, <laughs> perhaps the definition of liberalism should simply put be one whose regard for uh, human life perhaps begins wherever along the spectrum from conception to birth, but actually ends uh, at, at the moment after death or later. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'd add that there's an autobiographical element to Ken's understanding of what liberalism is. As Alan says, there are many kinds of liberalism, but I, I came to conclude that Ken's idea of liberalism was shaped in his very childhood, not just by his father's commitment to Canadian liberalism, but also by the life experience that he had. He grew up in a community, as you saw on the film, in which there were no rich and there were no poor, and people supported themselves but lived in a community of mutual caring and obligation. They were also capable, as all small towns were, of suspicion and rivalry and the like. But I think that the idea that Ken always carried in his head was to somehow want us all to be able to live in a world in which there was a strong, powerful, expansive middle class and a much weaker and, uh, 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 class of great wealth and certainly uh, no class of, uh, of, the, of, of the severely poor. I, I, mean, I, I think there's something more modern to it than that, if you like. Uh, they, when, I, when I said it was Schlesinger's traditions and Dad's tradition, what I meant was that these are people who grew up in a century when it was possible to believe that the large organization could serve the larger good, mm -hmm. and that there would be a network that extends from the government through uh, the system of countervailing power, business and labor, and to perhaps other entities, uh, that would create an acceptable, stable, progressive, and reasonably fair mm -hmm. uh, system under which the uh, vast majority of the population would feel uh, included and which would serve the, their interests and to which they would be and feel justifiably loyal. Uh, and that's, that, to me, is what my father's liberalism really represents. It's not romanticizing the small community or the, uh, or the competitive system. That's, in some sense, a very conservative uh, attitude. It is not tolerating as what I described as the predatory abuse of the larger system. It's about making that system work and using your life to, uh, to see that it does. I think Jamie said it well earlier, actually. I don't want to extend the what is a liberal game too long. But the, the countervailing power concept is critical, and that I think American liberals, in contrast to state socialists, feared concentrated power in the state and wanted to protect against it, and in contrast to radical free market conservatives, also feared concentrated economic power. Mm -hmm. And the genius of American liberalism is that it was willing to fight both, and at its most successful, it succeeds. Right. Over here. I have two questions. Uh, I'm a graduate student here uh, at Harvard. My first question is, why are there so few economists in the mold of John Kenneth Galbraith? Ah. Amen. My second question is, given the enormous public policy influence economics has, especially compared to other disciplines such as psychology, sociology, and political science, what can the Kennedy School of Government do to foster a more moderate, pragmatic, and realistic form of economics? And I leave Litauer out because that's probably a lost cause. I, I, I think there are a couple answers to that question. There's a, there's a quite practical one, which is that there was a debate, there has been a debate within the economics profession and academic economics that has gone on for a century and a half. 
Harvard's is the oldest economics department in the United States. It was born out of a conflict over free trade policy in the 1870s. A group of Boston businessmen didn't like the view that the one fellow teaching political economy took, which included support for uh, ter uh, tariffs that would uh, support infant industries, and also for not paying back Civil War bonds at full face value. They went to President Eliot, offered to endow a chair in a different kind of sound economics, and Eliot accepted the chair and uh, quickly hired a young man who had no uh, training in economics, but was a Boston editorial writer uh, who supported free trade and the full repayment of Civil War debt. Now, I'm not doing this to single out Harvard, but there has been for many years a tendency in economics departments to narrow the, the profession to one that focuses on mathematical competence and uh, eschews attention to the real world. A study done by the American Economic Association itself about 12 years ago, and certainly not a, 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 a committee headed by radicals. It was Larry Summers, it was uh, uh, Ken Arrow, it was a number of other people. And they found in surveying American economists that 62% of the profession agreed with the statement that economics had become over-mathematicized and too unrelated to the real world. I think in, in answer to the question, what can the Kennedy School do, yeah. which David really should answer, but right. uh, I, I take, take that as a question, what can schools of public policy do? Um, at Columbia and at many other universities, there are in effect second economic departments, developmental economics, uh, labor economics, regional economics, things that have been shoved out of mainstream economics professions and that have taken root in other uh, parts of universities. Uh, and I think that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, why are there no more John Kenneth Galbraiths? I don't think whatever the state of an economics, the economics profession, an, another John Kenneth Galbraith would likely come along. Uh, people like that just come along once in a very long time. Uh, but I do think there's more diversity among econo economists than economic departments represent. Uh, someone mentioned, uh, I, I sense rather disparagingly, my colleague at Columbia, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, but he's an example, whatever you think of his work, and I think highly of it, uh, of someone who has broken out of the, the constraints of economics department, Joe Stiglitz, also mm -hmm. one of my colleagues at Columbia, but there are many, many economists uh, in, in many universities who are not constrained in, in, in this way by, um, by the, the norms of, of the profession. I, I, mean, I agree with that. Decentralization, the creation of autonomous units in universities with independent intellectual traditions is certainly the way to go to assure the future of economics as a useful uh, intellectual pursuit. But I do want to say also that a couple of years ago, uh, a small group of relatively young academics in Paris uh, decided to organize a conference on uh, my father's uh, intellectual tradition uh, and put out a call. And the response was truly overwhelming. A number of us were there. Richard was there, Paul Davidson was there, my mother was there. Uh, but it took us four days to get through all of the papers. People came from Australia, they came yeah. from Brazil, uh, they came from all over Europe and from the United States. And as I said, it took us four days to get through the papers. So the Galbraithians are not as rare as you uh, may imagine, and they just happen to be rather far flung. I happen to bring up his answer to this. In uh, one of his books, uh, Galbraith wrote, I quote, economic ideas are always and intimately a product of their own time and place. They cannot be seen apart from the world they interpret. He went on that change in economics has been slow because, quotes, those who benefit from the status quo resist change, as do economists who have a vested interest in what has always been taught and believed. <laughs> Over here. I'm Jim Flug. I'm a uh, fall fellow at the Institute of Politics. Uh, I am an unreconstructed Galbraithian liberal, and uh, I believe had him as a freshman here many years ago. And first, a factual question that perhaps one of you can answer. I met him once in an airport in Europe, probably in the early 60s, 
and I introduced myself and asked him how he was, and he said, how can one be after just avoiding World War III? What was it he had done, it was while he was ambassador to Indian, that, that led him to, to say that? 62. And uh, uh, is my recollection correct? And it's, my probably Oct it's probably Cuba? October 62, immediately after the uh, sure. Cuban Missile Crisis, which I might add, he was simultaneously distracted by the fact that the Chinese were warring with the Indians. So he was busy simultaneously. And there was a real sense, of course, that the Cuban Missile Crisis represented the possibility of World War III. So it could have come at any point in late fall of 1962, would be my first guess. What year was this? I, it was probably the winter of 62. I thought yeah. he was coming back from India though, yeah. and he had just done something maybe between India and Pakistan. No, we had just had the border war between India and China, uh, in which he played a major role. Uh, my other question is, um, in my lifetime, there's always been an institution for people like him and me, and people who call themselves liberals, which was the Americans for Democratic Action, which Eleanor Roosevelt and I believe Arthur Schlesinger and Ken Galbraith were, were leaders of over time. Whatever happened to it? I, I, it must still exist. I can't tell you who the chair is. Did they all just let it go, and, and was that a conscious decision, or it just happened that way? It still exists. exists. I'm, I'm, in fact, an honorary vice president of it. And I, I have to say that uh, one of the last letters Dad sent um, was a uh, drafted a few days before he died. Right. It was a fundraising letter for ADA, mm -hmm. which arrived at their mm -hmm. office a few days after he died. Uh, and the question came up of what to do with it. So I, I drafted a note to the members saying that he clearly intended it to be used, knowing uh, whatever might happen to him. So they should take it with the special authority of what it was, a letter from beyond the grave, and certainly the only one they were likely to get from I him. Think, I, think that, uh, <laughs> I think it's important to add, though, that organizations like the ADA, which were sort of voluntary associations of like-minded people, don't really play a significant role in the political world today. What plays the similar role today are well-funded think tanks, mostly on the right, uh, where people uh, who want to have influence on public policy go and are, are uh, and, and, and you don't see very many organizations like the ADA anymore, nor do you see very many, if any, well-funded think tanks of this kind on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think ADA also suffered from divisions over the Vietnam War. You know, and when you right. think of the original founders, yeah, ADA eventually became anti-war, but you Thank, know, Thanks ADA, to John Kenneth Galbraith, I'd add. I mean, it, his presidency in 1967 led to ADA's defunding by the AFL-CIO because of Meany's objection to Galbraith's leadership in taking the ADA out against Johnson in the war. Over here. Just one quick question. Um, currently in the United States, we have one out of 20 people is an uh, undocumented alien. And somewhere between half a million and a million, they don't know exactly, is a kid that has been school educated and has lived most of uh, his or her life in the United States. Uh, did uh, Mr. Galbraith ever address this issue about the uh, impact of the undocumented people? I mean, he probably got, saw, the, saw the good thing of the big migration of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, but the current uh, problem that we're facing now, did he ever say anything? I didn't hear, would you say, what, I, I, I'm sorry, the, the, the microphone is, what is it? The immigration, the immigration problem. Mm -hmm. I, I think basically he didn't think of it as an immigration problem. Uh, I think he was, I mean, as part of his general philosophy, uh, he was sympathetic to people who came to this country. He was one of them. Right. <laughs> he, well, he was one of them, but he was also, I mean, he came in, in, in relatively fortunate circumstances, obviously, with a scholarship to go uh, to the University of California. But and I, he, he was very sympathetic to people who, who came in much more uh, severe circumstances, and I think he also recognized the obvious, which is that 
immigrants very often do jobs that, uh, uh, that Americans uh, don't want to do, and the jobs need to be done. He often pointed out that early in his youth, his relatives and many Canadians from his part of the world, uh, after finishing an agricultural season with the harvest in uh, southern Ontario, uh, crossed over the border to work in Detroit's auto plants and didn't seem to give much thought to whether they were American and Canadian. And uh, the Democratic machine in uh, Detroit felt the same way and had them vote in both Canada and Detroit. So maybe and, and, part of the answer lies there. And, and he explained the fact that the Canadian elections were in the spring the Ameri when the, right. with the planting season and the American elections were in November after the harvest. And, so by voting for Mackenzie King and the Liberals in Canada and Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Democrats in, in the United States, uh, this was not thought of as anything wrong. It was simply a, 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 a patriotic a, a desire to have the best possible government in both countries. <laughs> so this is a good example of an issue uh, that liberals and everyone face to, faces today that would not have been on the, on the radar screen, yes. particularly of liberals 30, 40 years ago, from the Immigration Restriction Act of 1924 until at least the Immigration Reform Act of 1965, and probably another 15 to 20 years after that, immigration was not a very significant issue except along the Mexican border. Uh, and now it is a major issue in American life, uh, and one to which I don't think either party has, has an answer, witness the failure of the immigration reform efforts in Congress, failure on the part of both parties uh, just a few months ago. Now, nevertheless, I do think that for liberals, it's a question for which there are, there are very clear markers. This is a population which is, of all the populations in the country, the least advantaged, the most remote from, from political rights. Uh, and it's a population uh, which, on that account, I think deserves the solidarity of people with liberal spirit. We've reached uh, 8 o'clock, at which time we are to adjourn this uh, session. I want to thank you all for coming to join us for the American premiere of Abiding Liberal, and I want to thank my fellow panelists for their uh, extraordinarily helpful conversation this evening.